Hi, I'm Jarno van Vore, the creator of the Charlie and Remy Peter Show series. Uh, you can find those on my storefront, ternacious.itch.io. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic creator. She's, of course, the creator of Charlie and Remy Pitch a Show. The title itself is amazing. I'll let her talk about it. I'm diving ahead of myself. So we're joined by the ever talented Yaron Van Voren. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well. I had a nice day. Uh, I did some shopping today. It's Sunday, but normally the stores are closed. In summer, there's always like sales going on and such. I'd say it's a very nice day today. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. What I'm bringing today is my comic series I've written, Charlie and Remy Picture Show, which is currently at four issues. I'm a comic writer. I make up comics, to say the least. And then I hire artists to illustrate them. That's basically my creative process for the moment. And what brings me today is I kind of wanted to talk about them and I kind of wanted to, to let people know about them. I wanted to bring them out more into the world. All for Charlie and Remy Pitcher Show. Charlie and Remy are uh, two trans women who got the chance to pitch a show for a major streaming network. But throughout the comic, they realized that the policies in the workplace aren't as good or as upheld as they claim they are, especially towards diversity and LGBTQ. And at the end, it's hard to say it without spoiling, but they have to make like a decision if they want to pitch the show or not. And a lot of hijinks ensues. That's that's all I can say for the moment. And that's what I loved about, about the series itself here. I've read all four issues and I, I can't wait to see who you decide to go after next. I, I'm always curious, now you can confirm or deny this, but is this based off of a real life event or was this something that you wanted to bring to light? Uh, I, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, well, it's not a real life event I've myself experienced, but I'm transgender myself. And when this was at the height, when the Dave Chappelle special on Netflix aired, uh, the controversy surrounding it. Yeah, at the time I felt angry like any normal human would be. And then I remember the news getting from bad to worse, the way they treat the employees. And there was like a, a strike. Um, I remember a black person being fired for allegedly leaking data to other economic magazines. I think Forbes was one of them, uh, even though they didn't. And, she, and they were pregnant as well at the time they were fired. And... Yeah, it all got to me and I was like, I got angry and upset about it. And I was like, well, I'm an artist. So what can I do about it? To quote Kurt Vonnegut, he's been used a lot. This is one of those quotes that have been brought a lot about art when it's about art. Like art is like a drop of water in the ocean. Well, it means that art doesn't have this great impact that people think it has. And He's right, but at the same time, I just wanted to ventilate his anger, and uh, I did it in the best way that I know how, and that's writing a comic about it. Even if it does nothing, I don't really care about it, although I do want it to see brought to the top of Netflix and all the other companies I use in this comic. Just, just, I want, just want to see the reaction. I just... I just want to see how angry they will get. Like, when I was reading through these comic series, because it's such a tight story in such a tight format for 24 pages which is each each issue which is great to see i love that standardized this format you could really make short films out of all of these comics just simple five minutes and kind of like summarize your your entire comic into quick five minute films and i think you could have a 
blast just show showcasing it everywhere really oh, i think i, I think i think you could really do such great work with that truly <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the special effects may be a little above your budget but i think you know you could do you could work around it i'm sure ai could come up with something right you know? <laughs> oh boy <laughs> i'm just kidding uh, <laughs> you have an amazing team around you you of course are, are the writer for this actual amazing series here as well who is your amazing team that that you surround yourself with to create this this series well, there's, of course, uh, Brian Beardsley, the artist, and there's editor Claren Napier. Brian, well, it, it feels a bit kind of idealized to say that I, I found them immediately, but I was also looking for, like, it sounds a bit cruel to say, but I was looking for someone who was also in, who also had an LGBTQ background and... I, I couldn't find anyone. They were all already busy or so. I remember Brian. He, I'm also in a group called the Comic Jam, which is yeah, yeah. You, you've heard of it or K so, Casey Allen is part of that that crew. He's he, I've, he's mentioned this a couple of times. It looks like an amazing group. Yeah. So, but the pro the process is is uh, the, the writers write the script and then there are artists who pick the script and uh, I, I don't have much say in that. But I remember Brian doing one of my. A scripts one time and I thought he did a good job at it and I thought well why don't I approach him to do Charlie and Raimi and yeah to keep a consistency whenever there's a new issue coming about I'm asking Brian if, if he's up to it I'm sure he's got his own projects and such but it's been also a very wonderful journey also because he brings the pages in a very uh, fast tempo and it's amazing to always see them on on the page and like do some tweaks here and there and then bring it out in the wild and claire well me and claire are kind of we're good friends so i'm very close to her and i've always talked about my comic writing endeavors and she helped me through that process and when i was writing the fir very first issue of charlie and remy uh, i was kind of a bit worried because it might look uh, effortlessly on in the pages, but like the Charlie and Remy series are very sat satirical and there was stuff that I also wanted to get right and like just overall wanted to create a good comic in general. I wrote the script and then I sent her the script and she gave me notes on make some changes here and there. For the large part, that's minor, but I have uh, changed a page here and there. And she's also with the the art process, so I send her the the final art pages, and she gives some commentary here and there, like the war balloon needs to be here, or like aiming there, or I want to say I'm the brain <laughs> of the whole operation. I'm the person who basically comes up with the stories, and I feel like I I can't say this enough about them. They've, they've it's been very good working with them. Uh, it's, a, it's also a lot of fun. I'm also glad what they brought to the table as well, especially with Brian, but I, I don't think I would have done this on my own. You have a story to tell and you've broken it into four major areas. And, you know, this is a creative process. This is something you had to get out, like you said previously. You're looking at these mega corporations and the atrocities that they're currently doing, or maybe they've gotten better. Have they gotten better, really? Uh. You know, I, I haven't followed up on that as much as I'd liked. Actually quit my Netflix subscription after writing the first comic, so I'm not up to date all that. I know they did, and I'm blanking on the name, an animated series about with a trans man as the main character. Good, but they also cancelled the show afterwards. Well, I assume the Dave Chappelle special is still on it regardless. And that's for the BBC. Those were the biggest mouthpieces when it came to transphobia especially in the news and such and it, ha it has been quiet or I might not have not, not noticed it. I wouldn't be surprised if anyone comes in the, into comics actually they did this and that and I'm like yeah sure. Uh, the, the comics are dealing with pitching a show to various mega corporations. Who are the corporations in, in order of the release of your comics? Let's start with that. Okay so well, the first one, of course, is Netflix, because those were the uh, the instigators for the comic, I'd, I'd say for the, the, the genesis, if you will. Then the second one is the BBC, because while I was writing, well, news of the BBC was already being posted before the, the Netflix special, etc., the debacle. But while I was working on the first one, I thought it, sh 
shouldn't I work? Wouldn't it also be for the best if I w- wrote one about the, the BBC too? That's Charlie and Remy picture show in Great Britain. Charlie and Remy uh, picture show for the last time is Disney, because probably we'll say more about it later on. But I wasn't actually planning to make more Charlie and Remy comics. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't initially set it out as such, but then there was, I think it was about when Turning Red was appearing in theaters and streaming services that there was like news that Pixar and Disney animators weren't allowed to like use gay characters, gay content in their stories and such. And it's yeah, it's still prevalent today, even after I made that comic. Yeah, that's Charlie and Remy Picture Show for the last time. And then Charlie and Remy Picture Show Resurrections is Warner Brothers. And I and I'm even spoofing it in the fourth one as well, that all three beforehand had like a LGBTQ angle. It was it was definitely aimed at that, but and then in the resurrection I was like, well, we can't do this because there is no LGBTQ angle. And then Remy is like, they're holding back the release of the People's Joker, which just FYI for those who don't know, it, is like a Batman comedy slash parody made by a trans woman. It even stars Bob Odenkirk. I don't uh-huh. know. I think it was made as a response of the film Joker itself, but uh, don't quote me on that f- one. Uh, it's been a while since I've done some research. As of now, I believe the film hasn't been released yet. I think it got a few festival releases, but it also got pulled back. Resurrections was made because, well, um, Warner Brothers had a new CEO and he was like cutting back into the programming all the shows and such, like not only were the acts, they were scrapped altogether. And I thought, again, this is the, the anger angle. So I was like, I should make a comic about this again. Because of uh, all the news stories that come about when it comes to these mega corporations, and of course you've touched on it with the Dave Chappelle uh, show, as well as Netflix and BBC, Disney, and of course Warner Brothers. What is the process for writing these comics? Because I'm sure there's so much news out there. How do you choose the story or choose the angle you want to put into your comic it's a bit hard because i'm going to go for the top because uh these are like four issues so the first charlie and remy wasn't going to at least my first idea was like a comedian uh making up a show and then threatening like the audience he's planning on going to do horrible stuff on all under the guise that it's just a joke. I think we've all heard that before, uh, that argument. And I thought, no, this doesn't work. This is too ham-fisted, too cliched. It's not not that nuanced. I think it's also the plot to the film Joker. I assume so. I have not seen Joker at this point. It was only like osmosis at this point. And I was like, uh, well, uh, I should go f- look farther. W- what's the comedian, of course, is the problem, but was also the problem. And that's Netflix uh, basically releasing the special uh, on their platform. And the moment, you know, I have to go think back, there was also going news going around. And I thought to use that, Charlie at the moment says what's happening in the world. And it's uh, basically... The big boss, shall we say, that it shows it, it gets under a lot of pressure and it shows its true form. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but for the jokes, I think this was also like uh, a lot of it was my issues with uh, Netflix and their creative process as well. It's a bit of a, a combination of the two. A lot of it is. Like at the point, Charlie and Remy visit the computer banks, the, the algorithm, if you want, and it's like old timey computer server i don't know what the word is but it's like the, the ones with punch card and all yeah and i thought that was just funny how like the, the combination with the old-fashioned uh computer banks and such plus also like netflix has this tendency to produce content to say it to say it's truly i mean I, I don't like the word to use the like to use the word content but that's basically what they want to do basically and there's like a scene in charlie and remy where they visit the um put the scripts into this slop to make them more generic and such and it's like a lot of netflix shows are also generic and like aim to please and yeah i think it was both like even with the resurrections it's also like the love of art is, is also seeping in um 
uh, because I wanted to end Charlie and Remy, the first one at least, on a positive note that like we we don't need them. We we can do just do it ourselves. Maybe the the resources are limited, but uh, if we want to, we can do it ourselves. And uh, I I kind of wanted to end on that positive note at the time. Mostly as much as these companies hurt us, don't have respect for uh, their employees, their audiences, and the creators they eventually employ. Uh, I kind of wanted to make it clear to the reader that you can do it yourself, which in a sense I did with these comics as well. That's the process. of It's mostly like um, my eyes with the companies plus the things they're doing with uh, the LGBTQ community and how they pretend they care, but in actuality don't, and how it also reflects in their company culture as well. Not the actual company culture in the comics, but like uh, written to an extreme degree, of course. Uh, uh, taking taking liberties as, as you yeah. can in a comic, of course. <laughs> and yeah. also like... Um, Comparing it to current news, because it's it's very politicized at points, especially uh, in Great Britain, where uh, I purposely uh, put the BBC stuff, the entire BBC stuff, put them in Nazi uniforms. So that was very... <laughs> Uh, very telling. Disney, one of the, one of the major corporations. I think that was an interesting take uh, with, with your comic and that, that aspect. <laughs> well, you're taking an extreme cartoon viewpoint in, in satire and it now becomes reality like it, i'm sure that just blows the mind for us yeah it's it's oh god this reminds me of a quote by ursula k Le Guin where she says uh writers are not futurists uh we're just very observant people uh i'm sure it's quoted differently but like that's basically what she said yeah i'm very observant you see the news messages and such and you'll be like this is going to some place and you hope it's not the place where they go but then but then when there's like a message when claire messaged me about the bbc or something and it's like oh god no not again it's like real no it's really like i hate being right like especially because as much as i point and laugh at these companies i still kind of care about them especially with Disney, which will tie back into the process of, into the writing process, because I was actually, I used to be a very big Disney fan, so in a weird way, it's kind of cathartic, it was kind of cathartic to write, and also like using a lot of history and trivia, because a good example is when Charlie and Raimi visit the animation studio, and then they go into the, the, the museum, yeah. where it's like all the fan art by public Persona's characters, presidents, and then Remy at, at, the, at one point looks at a piece of work and says, who the hell is Adolf H? Well, it's allegedly, um, but there is actually Disney fan art made by Adolf Hitler. I, I'm not making this up. I can't find good source, but it's also been very known that Disney's favorite film was actually Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. You, you'd think I'm pulling a lot of it from my ass, but <laughs> oh, it's no. like... I, I'm sure there's history of Disney doing a lot of things and I'm, yeah. I'm sure it's been well documented as <laughs> well too, where you just have to shake your head in, in this day and age for sure. Yeah. Um, everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Oh God, that's a hard one because... Hmm. I honestly have no answer to that because it's like uh, the the best piece of advice is uh, I follow horror writer Gretchen Falke Martin on uh, Twitter and she often says you have to do the work basically writing put it on a page and that's if I want to see something done I have to do it myself and uh, good God Sorry, it's it's such a, such a broad question. I like I can't really answer it. Yeah, I think maybe the second piece would be coming from Claire, where she said, "You don't have to draw anything." I actually wanted to be a uh, a comic artist 
uh, prior to being a writer, but uh, and it was when I was like what eighteen or something in my teenage. But I got like major depression, heavy burnout. I kind of lost the uh, motivation, basically. Uh, sometimes I draw, but it's not like I kind of want to make it full time or like do something with it because I'm on on one hand I'm way too insecure. What's the other word I'm looking for? Like self-conscious about my art. That's the word. And honestly, I'm glad there are artists out there who draw better than me because, yes, I'm the writer, but I don't think my comics would ever exist without their help. So I guess that's like best writing advice I can give. That's the best advice that someone has given me. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? What was it? Hmm. Those questions are kind of hard because that means I have to very, very deep and I can't like, uh, hmm. let's see when that language has power. I think it's something I've been aware of by like more like short instances, but again, I think it's also with Okay, I'm, it's maybe a bit of a cliche to bring it back to the Charlie and Remy comics, but like uh, considering uh, you have Dave Chappelle who has like a big platform and then you also have J.K. Rowling who also gets her uh, turn in the comics uh, and she also has like a big platform and even if it's... There, there's a lot of people against it, but there's also like a lot of people for what they say, uh, even if like more of a minority than like the 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 ones who who know that it's wrong, the ones who it's 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 interesting to think about because like I think it's also what people want to hear. I'm also thinking about like Nazi Germany and like how that got like a rise to power. Well on one hand it was basically like um attacking the foundations of the German government at the point, but also the, there's a lot of people who are willing to fight for it. Uh, uh, there's also a lot of people who are like really behind it. And it, it's, it's on the one hand, it's also kind of depressing, but on the other hand, this is why you kind of also make need to make these kind of... Uh, things this kind of books this kind this kind of art uh to make a stand well to make a stand sounds like a generic like uh we have to make a stand stuff but like you you, you kind of have to in this kind this case like it's also infuriating that yes language has power but it is also like uh, the people who are in power uh, have access to it the the, the best way uh can utilize it with, with they have the best resources and it's it's frustrating so i never said it to me my, to myself as well but i think that's what basically uh made me want to write these activist comics if, if you can say this, this i think that's what did it for me to make these comics i, I know it was the, the, the question itself was kind of broader and but uh, i think it applies well with the subject matter in this with these stories is there anything that i haven't touched on uh, that you'd like to share and showcase we'll talk about social media and where we can find you and support your comic as well at the end of the show but is there anything else you want me to ask charlie and remy like poor sh short stories that i made over the over the years it's kind of funny like the netflix of course was going to be a standalone but then the bbc came and then it was like well i better rather write a sequel to it and i kind of wanted to have it a bit of a downer ending at first and like leave these two comics at that so like in uh great in great britain they realize that it's basically we've actually experienced this before the first time so that was kind of deliberate like a one page is a, like a mi mirror of the very first page in charlie and remy so it's like the mirroring in that was deliberate and then disney came along and then it's like well, it's going to be the last time because it's it's the, I'm going to end end this show, this series like at the end of the world, literally like the end of civilization. Yeah, which I which I think was a very good ending. And then like the the, the Warner Brothers was coming up, and I thought, 
Oh God, I got an inspiration for another one. So I'll, I'll write that down. And I was like, this was going to be like an, uh, a short epilogue, but then I was like, it was like 10 pages and then I finished it. It was like, mm, I don't feel satisfied about it. So what else can I do? Well, I, I'll put in a bunch of yeah. extra short stories in to make it a bit longer, which I'm glad I did because the tour segments ties into the main. I felt like I had to do that one to get more with the themes of what Warner Brothers is doing in general. So, And that's what I love. I, I love the fact that your your story continued from the end of the world into Resurrections. And I thought that was a really cool way to to bridge that gap as well too, <laughs> because I didn't think you were going to go like do like a time travel where they kind of jump back before the world ended or anything like that. But I thought it was a really cool way to continue that, that overall story. I guess then the, the question is before I jump to my others is, is uh, are you going to do any other stories? Do you have anything else coming down the pipe? I fiddled with the idea. I'll, I'll, I'll say that this, uh, I had this idea, but it was more for the structure to like do it in, I want to say a two-parter, but it's going to be one book. As a reference to the Metal Gear games, mm -hmm. I always said this is going to be my last Charlie and Remy. And then Claire said, she always said that. And I had this idea to, uh, if I was ever going to do the fifth one, I'm going to call it the Phantom Pain as a reference to the Metal Gear. Well, Resurrections itself is also like, was it a deliberate reference to Matrix Resurrections, yeah. which also is a property owned by Warner Brothers. But I don't have any subjects for it. I was thinking maybe about the the writer's strike, but like nothing concrete has come up yet. Jokes, any jokes or storylines I want to introduce. So, and I feel like I'm not in the best position to write about it. I don't know much about the nuances about it yet, as as of yet. I do support the strike if that's yes. what people are asking and. As for comics, well, okay. this feels like I'm promising something, but like, but I don't think it's going to be made for international audience. Uh, for the listeners who don't know, I'm Belgian, uh, I'm Flemish, which is kind of Dutch. So, and uh, I wanted to write a book and get it published by a Belgian publisher, which is my thing, considering the location, which would be make it more apt. So. I can tell maybe a bit about the um, project I'm doing. I have finished the first draft for now. It's zombies have appeared, but uh, there's no zombie apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Instead, the zombies are being like put in a warehouse uh, and being shipped by companies as a replacement for uh, cheap labor, basically. The uh, premise was uh, based on AI art in general, like trying to cut out the middleman. And I and I had this idea, what if instead of AI, we had zombies? And uh, the story is basically about two employees of a, uh, of a zombie warehouse who have to sh ship and deliver zombies. And they're being underpaid, very understaffed, overworked. And it's mostly from their point of view, while there's also being like atrocities being committed in the world. And then at one point, one of them gets bit. She's about to die. And it's a very compli complicated story for the moment. I honestly don't know if I'm going to change a lot or th that's a project I'm currently working on. So, and I hope it gets published. I'm going to send the script to a... Um, publisher and see what they will think about it and if it doesn't happen well there are other means there are other means i i can like find something else to do to make it happen because personally i i like it a lot it's one of the biggest things i've also done and i'm very proud that i actually finished it like at the moment it rests at 70 pages in total and and i want to create like this kind of atmosphere of banal banality and um kind of anxiety and and i also never want to plan like do an actual zombie apocalypse because i think that's a bit cliche mm -hmm. especially in this kind of setting too but yeah i'm actually really excited about it i hope it gets off the ground and i actually want to share it with the world that's like now the first draft is done i'm going to actually write a small short story for the website 
just not a comic story or a script, just a short story. That's it. Just right. as an in-between. Do you have a title for it already or are you kind of still thinking of it? The the, the uh, working title was called Workers of the Dead. Uh, <laughs> as, as a, of course, during a Romero, but uh, I was also thinking Zombie Depot <laughs> uh, sounds like a good title, both for national as well as international markets. I don't know where, where, where it's going to bring me. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's going to be even longer. I don't know if it's going to be shorter, gut cuts. This is something also about the working process. Uh, the finished product is mostly close to, sort of close to the f- to the first draft, actually. Like, I'm someone who knows from the beginning where to go and what to do. The second, the finished draft is most, mostly me cleaning up the dialogue, make it more readable for the, the, the reader. And then, depending on if I have an editor or not, make additional changes. Maybe Claire will be your editor this time around again. (laughs) Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Hmm. That's a hard one. I think maybe like comic writers like Alan Moore uh, or René Rossini from the Asterix comics. I think they were a big influence. At least they're not necessarily an inspiration, but they were a big influence on my work, uh, especially with... Uh, Rene Gossini and I think it's basically because uh, during the period that I quit drawing and before I started writing I had this kind of slump I know I'm very creative and uh, I like to be creative as well Uh, but in that period it was like mostly looking for my voice for what's a good creative voice and I bounced back and forth between like project and such before I settled down on comic writing because uh, I realized I have a very good sense of pacing, sense of ideas, sense of storytelling. And it's like, I think it mostly clicked. I think she will be flattered to hear it, but like Claire was also a major inspiration uh, for doing this, mostly because she uh, encouraged me of doing this. Yeah, I think those are... Those are the ones who I say would have inspired me to do to do comic writing. From a professional standpoint, you've created many comics, including this amazing series with these four comics of Charlie and Remy pitch a show, and you've done extremely well in that regard. And so professionally, you're successful in, in that regard as well, because not many people can say that they've created comic books. So congratulations on that. That's true, yes. <laughs> do you consider yourself personally successful? Um... But I think it's a bit of a half and half. I think I'm, I think I'm personally successful in the way I write, the, the way I make comic books, not in putting out my stuff, uh, promoting it and having an audience because it sounds maybe a bit selfish to say, but I also want a larger audience to read my work, to get my work around, to get reactions out of people. Yeah, I'm definitely successful in the creating comics department. Uh, or at least f- finishing them, at least the comic writing process, because th- it's basically the artists who have to draw all the the panels and such. They're doing the most, they're doing the hardest work. But yeah, I'm definitely successful in writing them, bringing them out. Not successful in promoting, getting an audience. That that's still the hardest part for me. But I hope that that'll change maybe in the near future, because like I said. I, I don't know if I said this. I, I want to get the big chiefs of the companies to read these comics as well and just to get them to pop a vein or something. Just some reaction to get out of them. Some reaction. <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh, boy. Um, at first, I didn't do very well. But the more I'm doing this, the more confident I'm getting it's mostly like, again, these comics aren't picking up, aren't getting picked up. Nobody's reacting to them. Nobody's reading them. It sometimes feels a bit disheartening and then you can feel like a complete and total failure. But on the other hand, I am proud of what I've done. I sometimes, in my desperate situations, I remind, I think of myself, I can make comics. I can actually do this. And I'm actually damn good at it and sometimes 
I'm reminded of that myself with the the reactions people are giving and the way I know how to work this because I have like eight in total. It's it's been a while since I can, but I know I can do this. I know I can. The artists I work with are always very positive uh, about reading my work, about reading the scripts. To come back to that question, I don't know how to deal with failure, but I but I got better at it. Let, let's just say that. The younger generation is looking at your work and then becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or a creative person in some way, shape or form, maybe you've inspired them with your creative works. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Hmm. That's a very broad question because I don't think about it that of that pers- personally myself. Uh, I know we're all getting inspired by creators, be they recent or from many years back. And every piece of art is basically not only a response to the world, but also a response to that creator. Like the way, uh, like structure, the way, the way we pick up like story beats and story things. Like, and I, I think it's also like looking a lot, like of absorbing uh, stuff. No, know, knows what works, knows what doesn't work. And if the younger generation would be uh, inspired by it, I, I feel, I feel really honored by it. Even if, if, even if it's the like break down my work i mean it's 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 a response and and i, I don't mind the critis- criticisms like yeah i know the charlie Raby series are good but there's probably like some valid criticism here and there there was something i thought about myself as much as it is about diversity it's still from a very wide perspective but that's because a it's my perspective and i'm also very white so if there's going to be criticism about that um, then i'm totally accepted there was was something um claire mentions this when i presented her the very first script of the very first charlie and Remy, she, she said uh your comic is funny and sad like if south park wasn't created by douchebags and i have <laughs> i i've taken that compliment up as a badge which is weird because i actually am not a south park watcher i've like seen a f- seen some episodes and i and i can see the resemblance and like maybe it's also an answer to south parks charlie remis may could be seen as an answer to south parks policies and their viewpoints so but i but i'm gonna say it was mostly unintentional so i i really didn't have south park in mind when i wrote this if your life was a comic book what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Uh, good. God, that's... As a soundtrack, I probably think it will probably be a large part of the Neon Genesis Evangelion soundtrack. Mostly because, A, I'm also a huge fan, but there's also, like... This is something in the trans community that a lot of people uh, feel very... Especially trans women feel very... See themselves in the character of Shinji Ikari, so... As for a comic book title, hmm, I don't know. I think it must be something like, have you heard of the uh, the books, My Lesbian Experience with Loneliness? Heard of it, haven't read it. Yeah, the, the, they're very weighty titles, but I, I assume my, it's, it's also one of my favorite uh, mangas at the moment. So mostly because it's also very recognizable for me as well. So unfortunately not give it a title, but I hope it's going to be like, if it's gonna have a comic book title, it's going to have some like some hefty title because the, the the English books are have like very hefty translations. So I hope it's gonna have like that kind of title. But I can't give an exact title. Sorry, that's, that's okay. <laughs> not not many people can, to be honest. It's just <laughs> it's one of those things where I just you kind of spring the question on them and and away they go. Well, yeah, and I do hate to say, it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a pleasure. Yeah, I really had fun talking about it and talking about art in general. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where can we find uh, these amazing comics and all of your other works and uh, maybe your storefront as well? Well, uh, you can find me on my website, uh, yarnevanvore.com, which is 
basically my name, but you can also find me on Twitter for now. So uh, that's at G E R N A C E O U S, which is also the name for my store from gernacious.itch.io, where you can find not only the Charlie and Remy books, but also other uh, books I've worked on with different artists. There is also like, uh, there's Brian Beardsley, of course, but there's also like Zach Hazard Falpen. <laughs> oh God, I'm butchering his name probably. Panu Patra, he's also on the, who's also like a very good, uh, amazing artist to check out. What else? You can find me on Instagram, jarne.van.foren. That's where people can find me. I hope to make it over to Blue Sky one of these days, as soon as I get like an invite code or I'm the next in line on the waiting list. So, but that's all, all about where you can find me for the moment. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word T-W-O, not the number two. Totally different website you don't want to go to, trust me. The website's going through a revamp, so go to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 12 or so years because reasons. It's twogeekstalking.podbean.com, but search for Two Geeks Talking on any of your favorite podcast streaming services where you get your podcasts. And like and subscribe that as well, too, if you don't mind. Of course, as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.